welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, I continue my conversation with three Bay Area theater makers of color who are working to ensure diverse voices and stories are heard and represented, both on stage and throughout the theater ecosystem. We also discuss the importance of looking at the issues and challenges we face through different lenses and how the arts can guide us. My guests today are Bay Area artists and theater makers working to elevate the work of theater arts and artists outside the mainstream and to ensure that all voices are heard among the Bay Area theater arts community. Beatrice Thomas is an interdisciplinary artist, cultural strategist, and equity, diversity, and inclusion consultant with Authentic Arts and Media. Eli Sunny Orquiza is a freelance theater maker in the Bay Area. And Nikki Martinez is programs coordinator for Theater Bay Area. This is part two of our interview. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. Beatrice, how can the arts help us rethink about the way we look at things, the way we deal with crises or face our issues? I just wanted to offer that, you know, we, we, we don't have to take um, in you know, rugged individualism and self-interest as our natural state. I actually think our natural state is the family state, which is to be looking out for everyone. Of course, like, you know, we learn how to manipulate and get, you know, get the things that we want. But I think that if we can spend more time lo- leaning into those things that we do collectively for the collective good, I think as a mother or a family or a caretaking person, most of the times you are creating systems that are going to work out for everybody and that are going to sustain everybody. So I just wanted to just throw in there that if we can kind of shift our thinking towards, you know, mutual aid and solidarity, also to share, share in these systems that other folks have been creating so that we, you know, like this is a moment of like sharing tools. And so mine is not to say, one is bad and the other is it's more to acknowledge all that is on at the table and try to bring in a more cooperative more intersectional more intergenerational because our elders have been left out you know of the game you know so i just wanted to offer that we 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 can actually exalt in the places in our lives where we do try to create equitable systems for all and start to lean into how we do that how do we and like let's start to get those things written down get those things codified yeah you know what i I love it getting outside of the frame we've the water we're swimming in right getting outside of the frame and looking back on it that's one thing i really appreciate i just uh was teaching a james baldwin piece to some students and one thing i love about i mean so many things but one thing i love about james baldwin's work is that he got outside the frame and so he's able to look back on it yeah and i so appreciate that and i feel like we're also in a moment because it's all this stuff is happening where we can start to get outside the frame and talk about it differently and reframe it as you're doing you know, to the even to the oh my god, we didn't have toilet paper. Wow, I'm relying on someone else to bring toilet paper to my store. Like, uh, oh, oh my god, you know, it's like even to that it, it, to that really basic economic level, we have reliance on others. We we are working in systems of humans, and and I think arts can really bring that to life, as you said earlier, with, through storytelling and through sharing. Um, the way the way that um, this can happen, the way that this can look, the way that this can be. This, this sort of like um, idea of this pandemic providing us different insights of other ways of living and reconnecting and reshaping life that we are in. Because I, I work in the theater, um, our primary work is to imagine, right? And, and to, to, to build worlds that doesn't yet exist. And, and at this current time, it's so funny because we're failing to imagine a world that is inclusive and equitable yes. <laughs> and, and just like diverse and, and representative of our, um, our own communities. Region. So I think we have to also address that. And, and, and it's so sad that we're failing our very own industry and are failing our very own community um, by upholding stories that are one primarily white, not gonna lie, um, and and that doesn't serve our BIPOC community and and doesn't open the doors 
for people to come in in a safe place to commune and gather together and to hear all of those, right? So I think we are at such such a pivotal time right now to kind of rethink that and reshape and restructure everything that has been fundamentally um, wrong and, and that has barred us for histories. Yeah, that's right. And just to like piggyback off of that, it's just like really thinking about how our society has sort of molded every career that we, we are sort of like pointing out specifically like the arts, right? It's a very Americanized way to think of the individual. Like I have to take care of myself first before everybody else. Um, but if you look at other countries or just culturally, um, myself being Latinx, it's like very much like, okay, we have to figure out what's going to be good for our family. And a part of that family is usually like the town or the village that you're in, right? What is the good of the people? In order for everybody to thrive and continue moving forward. And people have sort of like, in America, dismissed that. It's just like, it's supposed to be me. <laughs> I'm number one and I have to go first. Um, and we have to sort of get rid of that because that is also a part of capitalist culture of just like, if I'm working more, then I should get rewarded more. I don't see the benefit of helping others because I'm only looking at myself and going on this the rugged individual. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And this is why we're failing at um, <laughs> kind of like flattening um, COVID. Yeah. Because everyone is just all about themselves thinking about their individual selves and 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 i i still can't you know grasp the idea that people find it so hard to wear a mask <laughs> i can't grasp that either it doesn't make any sense to me yeah yeah. And that it's a political statement. That shocks me as well. The rugged individualism clearly exists because people want to do what they want to do. But there's also there are there is a nod toward community in U.S. culture. But it's as as Nikki said, it's my family, my neighborhood, you know, but that's a closed system. And we um, we have a hard time going outside our little closed system either. Well, what we have to remember is that we're experience, we're trying to get to something that hasn't happened yet. So there's no roadmap, right? And things that are new and different are uncomfortable. Things that are unfamiliar provide discomfort. We know that like certain groups of people in our country are feel very entitled to comfort and other groups are like, eh, it's discomfort, just keep on moving. Gotta keep it moving. And I, I, I just think that like we, we we have to acknowledge that different people are at different places people are at different speeds right and we have to have a collective conversation that allows us to uh, allow for those different speeds allow for you know to me i could care less about one individual racist or or just tat tacit racist, like a gentle, implicit bias type race. I can, I can care less. I want everyone to have what they need to thrive. It's to me, it's ridiculous that in a country where we have like some insane percent of the wealth in the, around the globe, and that it's held by like a very small number of people who have too, more money than they care to spend. So they're messing in our politics. Like they're like, their new pastime is to mess in our politics. So what I'm saying is like, if we have that much money, I want, look, I don't care about your, I don't want racism to exist, obviously, but I want every human person to have what they need to thrive yeah. more than I want one individual person, you know, racist or homophobe to get theirs, right? I, 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 let's keep our eye on the prize. White supremacy and all of these things hurts everybody. It doesn't just hurt, you know, me or, you know, Eli or Nikki or, you know, like it hurts everybody. And so let's get some skin in the game. Let's understand that what we're talking about in terms of like people having what they need to thrive is something that's going to help every American, right? It's going to relieve the pressure. Have y'all been online experiencing like the, some folks who are feeling relieved that they got a pause? <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Like that, that like people's first instinct when they have a minute is to ticking towards self-improvement. Yes. 
to like fixing what's wrong. So I, I'm saying what I just I'm making a case, right, y'all. I'm just like get get on get on this intersectional boat and let's go get some like self care that is let let's create a culture of care in America. We have the money to do it, and y'all billionaires still get to play with your toys, right? Like let's split up the pie so we can thrive so that artists don't have to like do 12,000 other jobs. They can focus on their one job, which is a job that requires skill, effort, you know, like, and time. And has a big payout and offers a great deal to the rest of the community or the rest of society. Like, it's not that there's no value. Clearly, if we're all turning to arts as the thing we do when our world shuts down, then clearly it has it's everything it's not yeah yeah and I think you make an excellent point about um about reframing this a little bit and it's understanding how society functions holistically and acknowledging that and also understanding that value isn't just about money there's there's all kinds of value and if we're willing to tamp down and lose arts then what does that mean for the rest of us like you said it harms everybody and when you talk about things like systemic racism or Um, sexism or homophobia, you're talking not only is that, of course, harming the people who are targets, but it's harming the people doing it because they're living with this ickiness inside, right? This hate and the suspicion and this need to sort of be conscious about, about, about separating. And that's exhausting too, right? So yeah, there's, there's, there's all kinds of harm that can be done unless we hopefully start really paying attention and starting to go reframe our pathways a bit. My question to you then is, where do we go from here? Beatrice, you made the very astute point earlier about, you know, arts communities have learned to thrive and support each other, and that's good. Um, but I've always thought it's interesting that in times of crisis, you know, when Jeff Bezos is making, is profiting by billions more dollars, that he's asking me to donate my $10. Um, and I'm willing to do, I'm willing to donate my ten dollars. I totally am. I want to help, but but I think we we attack we rely on each other to the point where um, there there is there is a larger amount of help that can come, it, it, and hopefully without strings. You also made that very astute point, Beatrice. Where do we go from here? So recently, I started this um, the Living Document, which is you know rattling the nation right now and and kind of like being used as an active tool to confront white supremacy that's happening in our in our region and, and beyond, right? And I think, you know, the living documents, and I'm working with a collective team right now, creating an action plan and demands to kind of push for an equitable, just, and, and inclusive theater community. As you look at the living document, each of those testimonials offered in the document stands on its own. Um, without judgment, yet in aggregate, right, we see distressing patterns of insidious ways where white supremacy, capitalism, misogyny, anti-Blackness function within the very industry that promises to celebrate us, our storytelling, our differences. Um, but we fail in, in that very essence of it. And I just I just want to jump in. The living document is basically a Google Doc where artists from the Re- Bay Area region can share their stories of of uh, racist acts or sexist or misogynist or uh, homophobic acts. Uh, And again, as you said, without judgment, but just to share that this happened. Yes, absolutely. Um, And it's very, I mean, in an aggregate, you're right. It blows, it blew my mind. It's so powerful and amazing. And I want to thank you for doing it. What we're doing right now is we're writing this 15 page document um, as a list of demands. Um, I'm working with local artists, theater makers, um, local artistic directors, managing directors, lawyers, and equity specialists to really craft this loophole-proof um, plan to be sent out in a couple of weeks to so all the theater companies around the region. Um, and, and we're sort of creating this push for um, equitable industry um, that hopes to become a model for um, regions across the country. So that's, I'm, I'm super, super looking forward to diving deeper into that realm yeah yeah real systemic meaningful change that's scalable i mean really uh, i can't thank you enough for taking that on um nikki how about you i guess my role right now is like uplifting and supporting eli eli and i have been friends 
be for, for way longer than <laughs> I'd like to admit. And um, we are just sort of working together and especially using TBA as a platform to uplift these voices, especially because of TBA being a resource center for Bay Area. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking about the role of arts in crises. My guests today are... Beatrice Thomas, interdisciplinary artist, cultural strategist, and equity, diversity, and inclusion consultant with Authentic Arts and Media. Eli Sunny Orquiza, freelance theater maker in the Bay Area. And Nikki Martinez, programs coordinator for Theater Bay Area. And then also, you know, not only in my administrative work life of being TBA and uplifting these voices, it's still nice to continue having these conversations and working towards a more equitable place in our careers because, you know, we've surrounded our work as like, we need to network with people, even if they make us uncomfortable, even if they make us feel a certain way, because if we don't, we're probably not going to get a job. And we need to disrupt this act of like how we create as artists. Like we can't just like suck up to the people that are abusers anymore. We have to show that they are wrong and we have to uplift people in power or uplift people to get that power that are not problematic, that are not racist, that are not homophobic, that are not predators. Like we need more of those people and we only get there by exposing them through this living document. And it's also really hard being BIPOC people exposing these things because we usually get most of the harm, you know, we get blacklisted, we um, get torn down. There's hate mail. There's a lot of like feelings of like entitlement. At least that's what I've experienced of just like entitlement of my time and answers and needing to do this and that. And so like right now, personally, I've been sort of like disengaging on social media um, because that used to be my safe space to just like relax and do whatever. But now it's sort of become a little toxic because of a lot, a lot of white people specifically have been asking me of their time being like, what about the living document? what about this and that? And I'm like, I'm not the fucking creator. Yeah. One, also it's a public forum, so you can look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and three, there's Google. Just, just look it up. Like, what, what's wrong with you? But of course I can't say that because a lot of people look at me and they're like, oh, you're the voice of TBA. Oh, you're partnered with Eli. And I don't want to like send everybody to Eli or send everybody to TBA. So it's very much like, okay, how do I divide these like personal boundaries and like, the way that I found it is to sort of exclude myself from social media for right now. And then also just work on like personal artistic um, endeavors of like playwriting and things like that. And also just like having nice conversations with Eli that are, that are not about the living document (laughs) that are just like bitching around and like having, you know, reconnecting with friends and like having that community sort of like connection. I think that's very important during this time in the pandemic, especially with all of this that's going on in our community of like exposing the white supremacy and the capitalist mentalities and like, you know, trying to dissect these. There's also time for self-care sort of like, you know, I know Beatrice and I have talked about this, which is like providing time to like self-care and like really regather. And I didn't really experience that until this four day weekend that I had and I was able to paint I was able to get plants I was <laughs> I just like you know and it was something that like I haven't experienced for a really long time because of this mentality of like needing to go 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 and work um, so it's really nice to step back and having that be my process of like moving forward of having that balance of like art and activism and me time yeah. And establishing that and helping model that for others. I think that's an important yeah. thing too. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, Nikki. Beatrice, how about you? Mm, um, I, I was listening. I feel like the first thing that I thought was I'm with Eli. I'm ready to um, imagine the future. Right. So, so I, I'm, I'm on Eli's train of imagining the future. I'm also on Eli's train of like, 
sharing our stories. Like that document is, is, is so much more than just a collection of complaints. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is a beautiful tapestry that paints a portrait of what many, many uh, theater professionals from marginalized communities are experiencing. It's so I can't wait till that document becomes performances, becomes visual articulations of, you know, that when these stories then, you know, complete that cycle of becoming, like turning into content that then gives those artistic experiences that can can bring understanding and shift. So that's, I can think that's one thing. I'm a total fan girl. What up, fan person, Eli, I'm in. For me, I have so many thoughts about where, where what I am doing to do or where to go. For me personally, I am working on my practice of liberation. So I am really working on liberating myself. This whole time frame has helped me understand that I pursue equity with a stick of white supremacy, meaning in my own practice of pursuing equity and wanting to see the world better for my people and all people and all of that, uh, I am taking, you know, just get the tenets of white supremacy out and I am applying urgency. I'm applying, uh, you know, quant more is better. Uh, I am applying, you know, scarcity. If, if I don't do it, who will, you know, all of these, the, the stick, by which I am choosing to beat myself with is one that is at odds with my values. And so liberation, like a liberatory practice is about me starting to apply the same values of care that I espouse to others to actively apply it to myself, to business, to the people that I work with, uh, <laughs> you know, and part of that is uh, I am on a, I got to liberate my language. One of that is getting pronouns. So second nature is first nature, right? The second is trying to root out all vestiges of uh, slave based language in my language, you know, slave driver, cotton picking, you know, like master sweep. sold down the river. Like, like so many, yeah, master sweep. Sold down oh my river. God. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even in tech master and slave drives. Right. So, so I am like, that is that. So that's a personal thing on a on a on a business thing. I'm in the business of equity. So I think part of that is balancing my business with, um, you know, everybody else's urgency. All of a sudden, everyone's really interested in equity right now. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what what? Um, but like being like trying to really hold to myself to understand that it's not my job to educate every single person that comes to me. It's my job to educate the people who are willing to pay me and respect me mm -hmm. for my expertise. And, and then when, and then there's my responsibility to give. So I'm trying to figure out right now how to, cause I can't, I can't, I'm so blessed that like the world is full of like people who are younger than me, not young, but younger than me. Uh, who, who like can really talk about how we exist outside of capitalism because I have spent my whole life and career trying to figure out capitalism to understand, like just trying to understand the, the like what the, the rules of the enslavement. I, you know, so it's wonderful. I feel like, you know, I, I have learned a lot about the money and I offer that to um, my, you know, young uh, compatriots to, if, for whatever strategy that can hold. But for me, figuring out capitalism has been huge and recognizing that the bowels of capitalism go much higher. I'm still trying to get into those upper echelons and cause some trouble. So like I'm playing a capitalist game. I'm, I'm looking at like who, who you know, because cost sometimes indicates who, who finds value in you. Right. So I'm, I'm messing around with with these kinds of like tactics, utilizing my business because I get I have a business. I'm not in a nonprofit. Right. So I'm swimming in this water trying to understand how do you maintain your equity, your values within a system that is built on, you know, the, 
the backs of my forefathers, like literally. Like, yeah, literally. Yes. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that space. I want a ton of money so that I can funnel it into communities that I see who have a shot at really making systemic change. I want all that money. I want any foundations or funders out there, give me the money so that I can distribute it because I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm connected. But the, the last piece for me that I'm sorry, I blah, blah, blah. No, that's all right. <laughs> like that awesome. last piece of like the personal, the professional, it's how do I, now that I am like, oh, capitalism, I'm trying to really figure it out. How do I also get the tools, the tools that I have into the hands of the people that, how do I get access, right? Because here I'm guarding my time and I'm trying to make sure people respect me in this capitalist frame. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's like the Nikki's, the Eli's and the, you know, the Kyle's um, in the world. I want to make sure that whatever wealth I am sharing, you know, up the chain is making it's easily and it's accessible into the people who are doing the work on the ground and trying to figure out how to create a system like that. So that that's something that I'm trying to figure out is how I give mm-hmm. yeah. within this context and to, uh, uh, you know, get up in there. Yeah. Just to respond to that, um, I've been working closely with this one artistic director who shared with me this very invaluable lesson that I've been keeping with me as I craft this action plan in, in that she told me, you know, to put yourself in the situation of a predominantly white institution or organization and crafting this action plan, this demands, right? This list of demands. And, and that has been very beneficial for me as I grapple with coming into terms to understand how they're going to receive this and, and what type of reaction that they're, they're going to, to get and, and finding a way to kind of navigate that and 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 find a better solution um to to making that happen and and making that robust and loophole proof as possible i i've been kind of like putting that on a daily basis as a practice of like what would this institution think if i received this feedback and and how to better craft a, a device of plans to to address that problem so that has been kind of like something that I'm grappling with and continuing to to develop um, as an artist. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Is there anything anybody wants to say that or that you think it's important for people to hear that we didn't discuss? You know, really, it, it is such a wonderful pleasure to be on a call that is predominantly people of color mm-hmm. from different um, from different ethnic backgrounds talking about how we get together with a, a non person of color it's just like this I feel like is this is what's needed more so I would just say thank you for your curiosity interest engagement and um I think it was so it's just thank you Nikki and Eli like for your work I'm so inspired and just like you know I don't know I feel very misty right now because I think this is the world that we're really working for and it's happening and we have to remember so the snapshot of this moment is just like i'm just going to try to hold this in my heart because it's this is the day this is this is the start of the day (laughs) yay thank you to this incredible panel beatrice thomas is an interdisciplinary artist cultural strategist and equity diversity and inclusion consultant with authentic arts and media Eli Sunny Orquiza is a freelance theater maker in the Bay Area, and Nikki Martinez is programs coordinator for Theater Bay Area. This has been part two of our interview. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing News in Context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.